my YouTube. I haven't made a video recently because I've been building a business and like moving house and all that kind of jazz. Um, but I have been reading quite a few books. So what I wanted to do, instead of making individual videos on all of them, because I knew that I just would never get around to doing that, uh, I'm going to do one mega review video. And I would still like to do videos on a couple of them. So if you have ones that you're particularly interested in and want me to do a full video on, um, write down in the comments and that might happen at some point. These are all mostly audiobooks so it's gonna fly by. Let's start with a crowd favourite, Tufts All The Way Down by John Green. Um, this came out beginning of October. I listened to the audiobook day it came out and then I read it when I got my beautiful signed copy there. Honestly, I freaking love Tufts All The Way Down. I just have one problem with it. So it's about this girl called Aza Holmes and her struggles with mental health, essentially. It's about her dealing with these intrusive thoughts. Um, but what it says, on the inside jacket is 16 year old Aza never intended to pursue the mystery of fugitive billionaire Russell Pickett but there's a hundred thousand dollar reward at stake and her best and most fearless friend Daisy is eager to investigate. The second paragraph is about her mental health. Anyway so this is my issue is that I think this is a profoundly quiet book. It's not an adventure book, it's not the kind of book that you have to chat about it with your friends and like discuss what side you're on and all that kind of stuff. It's the kind of book that would be most valuable if you found it in a library and just sat there in the corner reading it and like taking it in for yourself um, because it's so intimate and I feel like just because John Green is like this big name um, it hasn't been marketed that way and it can't really be talked about that way which I think is a shame. I think it's the kind of book where you can learn how to approach your own problems in life through kind of empathizing with Aza um, and that doesn't really suit like the hype train. I did freaking love it though. And now we have a series of audiobooks about business and productivity and self-help. So the first one I listened to was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I lost my notes to this book which is kind of annoying but I think it was written in the 80s it's like known as being like one of those long-standing self-help books. The narration was terribly boring, but what are you gonna do? I think the value of self-help books, it's not in like telling you stuff that you've never thought about, because I think in almost every self-help thing I've read, it's stuff that I already know, but it's just stuff I haven't like internalized. I think they lay out, they lay out the context of what they're trying to um, get into your brain, and it just gets in in a way that could be more persistent than if you idly come up with those ideas yourself. But since I've lost my notes on the seven habits, I don't remember any of them, so I'm not sure they're gonna be doing me much good. It was good though, it was very thorough. Next audio book was a four hour work week by Tim Ferriss. I think Tim Ferriss is so great. I love his like drive for life. I feel like he has all of his priorities in order. He has a fantastic podcast. If you haven't heard of it, it's called The Tim Ferriss Show, uh, two S's on Ferriss. On The Tim Ferriss Show, he interviews world-class achievers and performers, uh, and it's just great. I was listening to one the other day with um, Richard Branson. It was just, He's a great interviewer. The four hour work week is ostensibly about like how you can set up your life to only have to work four hours a week um, from like wherever in the world you want to. But it isn't really, it's it's like how to be Tim Ferriss is what this book is. And that's great because I do kind of want to be Tim Ferriss, but I feel like it misses one major thing. And that is that it doesn't talk about like wanting to find the work you do meaningful. I wish you don't think it's ever brought up because although I would love to set up like a complex system of virtual assistants and have all of this drop shipping and like all of that, um, I do still want to do a business that I actually care about and feel fulfilled doing. Okay, next book is Trust Me I'm Lying by Ryan Holiday. It's the first of two Ryan Holiday books in this review. It's Trust Me I'm Lying, colon, Confessions of a Media Manipulator. And it's all about how Ryan Holiday has like made these big marketing campaigns happen by finding like flaws in the industry but it's just kind of dirty. Like it's cool, but it feels dirty. It feels really immoral. It's all about taking advantage of uncritical people. So it's either the audience that aren't gonna be critical about like the news sources they read from. It's <laughs> very present. There is a lot of sirens on this road. Or it's people that haven't recognized the systemic flaws in their industry. It was interesting, but not anything that I would ever put into practice. And also something that's not relevant for most people probably. The next book is The Obstacle is the Way, which is also by Ryan Holiday. I was having a really, really bad day. I was just feeling so, so low. And then I went on a walk with my friend and I was starting to perk up. And then I came home and found that someone had broken into my car. So I canceled my like Halloween plans and I was just gonna like wallow in self pity for a bit. And then my friend was like, you gotta read this book. This is a perfect time for you to read this book. And he was so right. The Obstacles of the Way is about how you can take downsides and turn them into upsides. It's really just like how to change your thinking to not think of anything as being 
totally negative. It was a really uplifting book for me, but it was also just like intro to stoicism uh, with just loads of like Seneca quotes thrown in. But if you are going through a phase where you're feeling really down about something specific, this book could be really helpful to like give you that boost to keep going with it. Speaking of boost to keep going with it, the next book is Grit by Angela Duckworth. I've heard her talk on so many podcasts and she has a fantastic TED talk on the same topic. Angela Duckworth is a researcher and she's found out over decades of study that um, grit is the most important thing in being successful way more than like natural talent or skill, time or whatever. Um, it's just like basically about persistence and like charge for, for doing something consistently. I really needed to read this book because I've always kind of thought that my ability to like pivot off ideas and be flexible as a good quality. No, I think this is like my biggest flaw as a business person and it's really good to like be able to accept that. Duckworth goes through several examples of people that she found that are extremely gritty and try and understand like what it was in their past that made them that. And a lot of it is pedagogical. It's really like how you are set up in childhood is how you are gritty now. Like you can do things to, to change how gritty you are, um, but really it like is set up in the first 10 years of your life. Stuff like being forced to learn a musical instrument is so good for grit. And it doesn't have to be like, you're forced to do this thing, but it's like, you get to choose what instrument you want to learn, but you're gonna do it for a year. And after that, you can quit if you want to, but if you wanna do it more, you have to stick to it for another year. I have absolutely lovely parents, but they were kind of pushovers. So I never got that like strong hand to like force myself to be more gritty. But it's definitely something I've internalized as a problem. So instead of being like, I'm gonna pursue this project next and then this project, I'm gonna focus on one thing at a time and see how I can like, develop a steady routine around it or you know I just want to I want to get better at grit. <laughs> Next audiobook I was in Doncaster station at 7 a.m on a Sunday Saturday um, and I was stuck there for like an hour and a half it's a long story but I was like looking through my phone to see what audiobooks I already had and I had Modern Romance by Aziz Ansari. Aziz Ansari is just like so cool he is the guy I want to be. I was like binging Master of None for the previous week so I was like now is the time to listen to Modern Romance. And um, Modern Romance is a kind of investigation of how people find um, and keep romance in like modern ages. It's very statistical as well so he shows you like how people used to find partners like 100 years ago versus 50 years ago versus now um, and it just, uh, the outcome, like I concluded from that book that it's just really hard. It is so hard to find a partner nowadays without like actively seeking it. So it is um, made me think I should start dating again pretty much. Aziz is funny, but this is quite a kind of scientific book. It's not actually just like a comedian writing a book. It does have a like research basis, so be warned. My last three are physical books, so I can use my cute little book stand. I totally lied, although I do have Bram Stoker's Dracula in a physical format, lovely Penguin Inch Library copy. I did actually listen to it as an audiobook. Um, it was a fantastic audiobook, though it was a full cast, it had like Tim Curry in it, um, like an audible production, excellent. I was doing like six hours of soldering and I like, needed something fun to bring me through it. Uh, I never thought of reading Dracula before, I always thought it would be kind of like dry and boring, but this was a riot, it was like a gothic Victorian novel. Um, and just so much happened. <laughs> so the basis of the novel is that Count Dracula wants to buy a manor in England and he also wants to like ship stuff over and then there's this weird like two-way entrance into people knowing him and then there's this girl that like three guys love and she keeps like not having blood in her system so they keep transfusing her blood and then she dies and then this doctor Van Helsing is like oh I know I know what what it is and then there's like weird fog and they have to find all of these like boxes of soil and it's just like so much happens <laughs> and it was very fun i still have my reservations about victorian literature like treatment of women in this it's just shit and all that um but it was great i feel like i raced through it a bit quickly as an audiobook it would be a really lovely one to like curl up with at christmas next book i have is ender's game by orson scott card i did read this as a book i promise uh, ender's game is a ya sci-fi novel but it was written in i think the mid 80s so it doesn't Although it has a lot of like why sci-fi tropes, um, it was like the arbiter of them. The book is about this boy called Ender, um, who is six years old when the book starts, and I think 12 years old um, in the final stages of the book. 
uh, and it, he's basically being groomed to be the battle commander to win the, f the war against the buggers which are like this alien species. The majority of the book takes place in battle school which is really cool because he has to like lead these kid squadrons on this game that's like gravity and you have to shoot things, it's, it's like quite fun. But I didn't like this book. There were so many things that drove me absolutely mad about it. And chiefly it's just the premise. We need to find this one boy in the world that will be able, that has like the mental structure to be able to be the battle commander and win this war otherwise we won't win. And for some reason that starts at age zero, makes the choice at age six and at age 12 he's like literally leading the whole army. I don't know, it seems like that was written by a 10 year old that thinks that 10 year olds can have any amount of skill comparable to a 20 year old because I just don't, I don't think they can. <laughs> I totally disagree, I just really disagree with it. Um, and you get it from the perspective of Ender but occasionally from the perspective of these people around him that are trying to manipulate him. So they force these social situations around Ender so that he doesn't have friends and then he makes friends and then he feels really alone and then he feels like everyone's picking on him and then like, um, I just, I found it really contrived and then at the end it has like all of this new age bullshit and that is my least favourite thing to end a book with. It's just, no, 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 no. A large portion of the book was just like fun sci-fi, which I appreciate, but overall, no. The last book I have to show for you, we're almost at the end, is The Disappearances by Emily Bain Murphy. You might have seen this in my September haul. It's set in the early 40s and it's about a girl called Isla who has a little brother called Miles. Um, at the beginning of the book their mother dies and their dad is conscripted into war. So they go to live with uh, their mother's uh, childhood best friend um, in this town called Stirling, uh, which is a really weird place because Stirling and the two surrounding towns have these things called the disappearances, which is every seven years something from their life just like vanishes. And it's not like objects, it's like the ability to see the stars and the ability to see their own reflections and the ability to like smell anything, the ability to have dreams, like it's all really like strange things. And Isla's mum may have been the catalyst that sets off this whole disappearance thing. Um, so she kind of has to get to the bottom of it, but also it's just kind of fun. It has all this like magical realism elements where there are these things called variants that um, temporarily fix the disappearances, but there are also variants for like non-disappeared things. So variants are like powders and you sprinkle them on people. So you can like have a sprinkle of a variant that makes you be able to smell or see your own reflection, but you also have ones that make you like be able to run really quickly and like warm you up called embers. It's so much fun. So half of this is like a fun teen love story set in this like quirky town where she has to go to school and make friends, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then the other half is this like quite dark mystery about what has happened with the disappearances. I did enjoy this book, although I did see like quite a few flaws that kind of blocked me from really enjoying it. Um, like I feel like the conclusion wasn't, it was a cool conclusion, but I feel like it was like, had a lot of weight towards the end of the book, but didn't really make sense in the context of like, the whole thing. There's no way for me to describe that without spoiling it. Um, but also the way they use metaphor drive me mental. You know when you read a sentence and then you like think about it and you're like that doesn't make sense. I noticed this first when it, she said something like um, as jagged as the sun and it's like ja no <laughs> the sun isn't jagged like what are you trying to say? I fobbed down more of these when I came across them. There are just some strange logic flaws as well that floored me like there's this bit where they have to sign up um, for this competition thing and in one bit it's like people write signatures under the event but then like the next page it references that there was nothing under their name which makes no sense. He glares at us each in turn and kicks plumes of dust into the air to curl back on us. It settles along my teeth as grit. Has anybody ever experienced like dust actually landing on their teeth? I don't know maybe that's just a thing that I can't get here. There's this bit where she's talking about how her brother used to purposefully knock like tip glasses over um, and like there's no reason to talk about it until the end of the thing where she has like a fight with him and then she says another glass he's tipping over just beyond my reach it's like that's such a yeah reach is the word it's such a reach the other thing that drove me faintly crazy in that book was that it didn't really reference the, this is like in the middle of world war ii and just occasionally they're like talking about how they haven't heard from dad in a while or whatever um but i feel like a lot of the social customs like the way the kids act with each other are how they would now um, I don't think that that's how it worked and also didn't reference, it just didn't have enough like 
historical context in the book for it to actually ground it in that time period. But it was a fun book. I finished that book and I was like, oh, I want another like light fun book. And then I looked at all my shelves and I was like, I have no fun books left. Zero fun books I haven't read. So that was a very big review about all of the books. Tell me if you want to hear about any of them individually. I really hope this was in focus. I hope you like this new angle thing I have going on. Sorry about the glasses glare. Um, and I will be back with you soon. Goodbye.